Hello and welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan justifies terrorism at UNGA. Pakistan ups ceasefire violations on LOC. Taliban frustrated after presidential elections progressed in relative calm. And Jesh terrorists planning attack in India, New Delhi put on red alert. High-ranking representatives of various countries attending the 74th session of UN General Assembly were left bewildered when Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, while addressing the UNGA, laid more stress on justifying terrorism and terrorists rather than promoting the idea of peace. The Prime Minister spoke for about 50 minutes where he used words like bloodbath and nuclear attack. In an attempt to justify the mindset of terrorists, Imran Khan put special emphasis on psychology of radical Islamic terrorism. Pakistan's Prime Minister's speech was full of factual errors and ironies as he blatantly lied about Pakistan not housing terror organizations in its territory. Newsweek South Asia brings you a full analysis of Imran Khan's propagandist speech in UNGA. Lies, factual errors and propaganda, Imran Khan's pre-scripted speech at the UN General Assembly included all those ingredients which are required to create a blockbuster fictional drama. Terrorism has emerged as the gravest threat to world peace, but for Pakistan, it seems like a blessing in disguise. According to Imran Khan, or more appropriately, Pakistan's army and ISI, radical Islamic terrorism emerges out of marginalization. So, in other words, Pakistan's Prime Minister tried to convey that Pakistan sponsoring terrorism is not wrong because the terrorists have picked up gun for a noble cause, which is to uplift Islam. By using such statements in UNGA, Imran Khan not only tried to rationalize terrorism, but also continued with his attempts of inciting jihadist violence in Kashmir. Marginalization leads to radicalization. Some of the people who ended up as militants in Syria and other places were from marginalized Muslim communities. The Prophet lives in our hearts. When he's ridiculed, when he's insulted, it hurts the as we human know, we human beings understand one thing, the pain of the heart is far, far, far more hurtful than physical pain. And that's why the Muslims react. And I always thought that if I ever had the stage, I would try and explain this to, uh, to the world community, especially to the Western community, because having lived in the Western community, people didn't understand this. His statement that marginalization leads to radicalization does not hold good because if that was true, then wherever there has been marginalization, there would have been radicalization. But it's not true. In America, in South Africa, in Rhodesia, North Zimbabwe, Blacks were marginalized for so long, but they never took to arms. They never took terrorism. Even now, Hispanics are marginalized in USA, but they are not terrorists. Coming home, nearby, closer, Kashmiri Pandits, who were hounded out of Kashmir by the jihadi terrorists, did not take to arms. At the United Nations General Assembly is unprecedented and deserves condemnation from everyone. An open support to terrorists with words of encouragement coming from Imran Khan seemed more like a speech of a jihad-promoting leader rather than a national leader. At one stance, Imran Khan called himself a potential terrorist as he talked about a situation where if, in case he comes across an untoward situation, then he won't hesitate in picking up a gun for fighting his cause. So what do you think the Muslims are thinking right now? If there is a bloodbath, there will be Muslims becoming radicals, not because of Islam, 
because of what they will see that there's no justice when it comes to Muslims. I picture myself, I've been locked up for 55 days. Would I want to live like that? I would pick up a gun. Imran Khan's mindset is known since long. He is a terrorist. He is a sport of terrorism. And that is why he earned the name of Taliban Khan. He has been supporting Tariqa Taliban Pakistan at all forum. His party provides annual budgetary support to the madrasas run by Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, which are the nurseries for producing jihadi terrorists. India's first secretary in MEA, Vidisha Maitra, toned into Imran Khan for delivering a hate speech from world's most reputed forum. She further went condemning Pakistan's Prime Minister for using words that doesn't suit a decent gathering and rebuked him for issuing nuclear war threats to its neighbour. Unfortunately, what we heard today from Prime Minister Imran Khan of Pakistan was a callous portrayal of the world in binary terms. Us versus them, rich versus poor, north versus south, developed versus developing, Muslims versus others. A script that fosters divisiveness at the United Nations, attempts to sharpen differences and stir up hatred are, simply put, hate speech. Rarely has the General Assembly witnessed such misuse, rather abuse, of an opportunity to reflect. Words matter in diplomacy. The invocation of phrases such as pogrom, bloodbath, racial superiority, pick up the gun, and fight to the end reflect a medieval mindset and not a 21st century vision. Prime Minister Imran Khan's threat of unleashing nuclear devastation qualifies as brinksmanship, not statesmanship. Even coming from the leader of a country that has monopolized the entire value chain of the industry of terrorism, Prime Minister Khan's justification of terrorism was brazen and incendiary. Vidisha Metra took up Pakistan head-on on its claims of not harboring terror groups on its land and demanded that Imran Khan should clarify his position on defending terrorists like Osama bin Laden. India's representative further slammed Pakistan for mainstreaming terrorists. Mr. President, now that Prime Minister Imran Khan has invited UN observers to Pakistan to verify that there are no militant organizations in Pakistan, the world will hold him to that promise. Here are a few questions that Pakistan can respond to as a precursor to the proposed verification. Can Pakistan confirm the fact that it is home to 130 UN-designated terrorists and 25 terrorist entities listed by the UN as of today? Will Pakistan acknowledge that it is the only government in the world that provides pension to an individual listed by the UN in the Al-Qaeda and Daesh sanctions list? Can Pakistan explain why, here in New York, its premier bank, the Habib Bank, had to shut shop after it was fined millions of dollars over terror financing? Will Pakistan deny that the Financial Action Task Force has put the country on notice for its violations of more than 20 of the 27 key parameters? And finally, would Prime Minister Khan deny to the city of New York that he was an open defender of Osama bin Laden. Mr. President, having mainstreamed terrorism and hate speech, Pakistan is trying to play its wild card as the newfound champion of human rights. While Imran Khan seems to be obsessed with propagating anti-India rhetoric, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, without even mentioning Pakistan's name in the speech at UNGA, sent a strong message to terror-sponsoring country and its allies by calling out the international community to stand united against terrorism. 
After Indian government abrogated Article 370, providing union territory status to Jammu and Kashmir, the jittered neighbor Pakistan has resorted to continuous ceasefire violations across the line of control. Indian security forces keeping close tabs on the situation have neutralized quite a number of terrorists who tried to sneak into Jammu and Kashmir. We have a report. Pakistan has resorted to continuous ceasefire violations on line of control ever since Indian government abrogated Article 370, enshrining Jammu and Kashmir as a new union territory of India. In the latest attempt to disrupt peace in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan carried out heavy mortar shelling and unprovoked firing in Poonch district. The border areas have been witnessing continuous ceasefire violations from Pakistani side, putting local lives in danger. आज पौने आठ से सुबह से फायरिंग है हमारे कुछ बच्चे जो है वो स्कूलों में पहुंच चुके थे और कुछ रास्ते में जो जा रहे रहे थे और अचानक जो है वो फायरिंग शुरू हो गई जिसके कारण हमारे बच्चे जो है कुछ स्कूलों के अंदर ही अभी फंसे हुए हैं कुछ जो है वो घरों के अंदर शरण ली हुई है इस कारण जो है हमें बहुत बड़ा नुकसान है इस एरिया में कोई पता नहीं कि किस टाइम जो है वो फायरिंग हो जाए Pakistani forces have been using the tactic of violating ceasefire to infiltrate terrorists from early on, but time and again, Indian security forces keeping close taps on these terror activities have been able to sabotage such acts. A few days ago, three armed terrorists who broke into a house in Jammu and Kashmir's Ramban district were efficiently neutralized by Indian security forces in a counter-terrorism operation. The rise in attempts made by Pakistan to infiltrate terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir could also be seen as outcome of Pakistan's so, Prime Minister um, Imran Khan's hate speech at United Nations General Assembly as per defense analyst in New Delhi. The territory of these incidents which have suddenly occurred, one in Ramban, one in Gandharbal, and there's been a grenade thrown somewhere in downtown Srinagar also. Uh, the way I look at it is really not uh, well, let's not talk about the incidents at all. The fact of the multiplicity of these incidents all of a sudden, post the speech by Imran Khan there at uh, the UN, uh, I mean, this was a normal thing which was expected that when you go and talk like that, uh, talk hate and talk about, uh, you know, bloodbath, etc., possibly all these uh, elements which are here would get some kind of an inspiration and stage such things. So this is the first reflection of that, that if the Prime Minister of a country is going to talk uh, so much of uh, violence, uh, this is what is expected. The abrogation of Article 370 by India has certainly rattled Pakistan and effectively defeated the doubts raised earlier at the United Nations on the status of Jammu and Kashmir. Taliban have intensified their offensive against the government as well as the civilians ever since U.S. President called off peace talks between the two sides. They don't want to see the war on Afghanistan thriving and becoming a vibrant democracy. Over 500 minor and major attacks were claimed by them on the election day alone. However, a negligible damage to the government and citizenry has left them frustrated. And this is the key reason they have now sought a direct intervention of Islamabad into their impending defeat, a report. Amid fears of Taliban insurgent attacks and hate and tensions, the people of Afghanistan came out to choose their president on 28th September. Although a low voter turnout was registered in the country, one in every five citizens came out for voting, defying threats and braving slew of Taliban attacks on several polling stations across the country. An ardent supporter of democracy in Afghanistan, Safiullah Safi, came out to cast his ballot on face of Taliban insurgents who had cut off his finger in 2014. The <laughs> Zindawad. 
At least five bombs went off in Afghanistan's eastern city of Jalalabad on September 28, killing one and wounding several others as presidential elections got underway. Another explosion was reported near a polling station in Gandhar, with a number of small-scale blasts in Kabul and Jalalabad wounding around 21 people. The tight security ensured Afghanistan's presidential election held in a relative calm, though several small attacks were carried out by the Taliban all across the country. Just days after the presidential election got over, agitated Taliban, after being unable to dissuade many voters from casting their ballot, carried out a high-intensity landmine blast in the northeastern Afghan province of Kapisa, killing at least six people. Meanwhile, another group from Taliban outfit reached out to Pakistan recently to discuss the Afghan peace talks with U.S. Special Envoy Zalmay Khalilzad in Islamabad. The move is speculated to introduce a former player Pakistan that had earlier raised an infiltrated terrorist who later formed a larger part of Taliban outfit in Afghanistan. Calling Taliban a proxy of Pakistan and its intelligence agency ISI, Afghan National Security Advisor NSA Hamdullah Mohib recently made a statement at the United Nations General Assembly that his country would never accept being ruled by the proxy of Pakistan. The Afghans would not submit to any kind of enforced ideology or rule on our country. The Taliban are, are a proxy of Pakistan, uh, of not just Pakistan, Pakistan's intelligence agency. Afghanistan would never accept uh, to be um, uh, ruled by, by Pakistanis. I mean, if we didn't accept Soviet rule, uh, superpower, you, uh, it would be beyond imagination to accept uh, the proxy of a, uh, of a, a backward uh, country which has a hard time feeding its own people. The Pakistan-backed Taliban regime was overthrown by U.S.-led forces in 2001. The Islamic insurgents fed by Pakistan are now at the most powerful state. They have been violently disrupting the nascent democracy in Afghanistan and carrying out some of the most gruesome often deadly retribution on those who are part of it. Pakistan is setting up new records in non-conviction of terror leaders who are running open terror factories from its territory. UN-designated terrorists like Masood Azhar and Hafiz Saeed are leading comfortable lives under Islamabad state patronage, whereas innocent civilians of India and Pakistan continue to live under constant threats of terrorist attacks being planned by the terror groups led by the two UN proscribed gentlemen. India's capital, New Delhi, has been put on red alert after intelligence reports of Jesh terrorists planning an attack in the city. A new attack on India would once again prove that Pakistan's establishment has failed miserably in putting a curb on the activities of proscribed terrorists in Pakistan, a report. A red alert has been sounded in India's capital, New Delhi, following a Category A intelligence input about the presence of three to four hardcore and highly motivated terrorists in the city. A group of Fidain or suicide bombers belongs to jesh e Mohammed terror outfit who may have infiltrated into Delhi through Jammu and Kashmir to execute a terror attack in retaliation to abrogation of Article 370. फेस्टिवल को लेके दिल्ली पुलिस पूरी अलर्ट है और तमाम जो हमारे एंटी टेररिस्ट मेजर्स वो हमने लिए हुए किसी को घबराने की जरूरत नहीं है और तमाम जो हमारे पास इनपुट है उस पे हम काम जैश मोहम्मद हैज बीन ऑन एन ओवरड्राइव सिंस अगस्त 5th ट्राइंग टू सेंड सुसाइड बॉम्बर्स फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द बॉर्डर्स टू कैरी आउट स्ट्राइक्स इन इंडिया द ऑपरेशन इज बीइंग कैरीड आउट अंडर द सुपरविजन ऑफ मौलाना मसूद अजहर Azhar in past has been responsible for many terror attacks in India, including 2001 parliament attack and a recent Pulwama terror attack. Having known the vicious intentions of these terror leaders, Pakistan is still sitting quiet on conviction of these dreaded terrorists. In fact, it is busy funding and supporting terror outfits to carry out attacks in India. 
ever since Pakistan was created, it has never behaved like a uh, good neighbor. It always created tension, waged war. Then, you know, when they were defeated in 71 and 65 and 71, after that, you know, when they realized that their army cannot defeat India, they started, then they waged uh, militancy or proxy war in India. And uh, anti-India propaganda, they continue, you know. They have been doing all sorts of things, you know, which harm Indian interests in the region as well as within India, creating, uh, encourage militancy in, in uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, state, you know. So they have been doing, you know, waging, uh, attacking, uh, you know, on uh, strategic targets like uh, parliament, you know, attack on parliament or using these militants in uh, Bombay blast or many other such incidents have taken place. India has long accused Pakistan of not behaving as a normal neighbor since it harbors those individuals who are always on the lookout to unleash terrorism in India. Pakistan holds zero record on convicting dreaded terrorists. This ultimately has added more bitterness to an already sore relationship between the two neighbors. After rounds of ongoing debates in the United Nations, finally the leaders across the world have reached a conclusion that the onus to bring peace and resume talks between India and Pakistan lies totally upon Pakistan's decision to convict terrorists. While hinting on Pakistan's unwillingness to rein in terror components working inside its borders, Ellis Wells, U.S. Performing Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asia, stated at a particular briefing of the 74th session of the United Nations Basic Meeting that Pakistan needs to take action against those engaging in cross-border infiltration. But Pakistan, instead of taking actions, is seeking pensions for dreaded terrorists like Hafiz Said money even for his basic expenses in a, and for his family as well in Pakistan. You see, this is all uh, a farce that is created by Pakistan appealing to the United Nations to let him allow use his account. And now when the United Nations has allowed him to use uh, his account for his personal expenses, do you really think that those expenses and his account money will be used only for his personal use? It is impossible. Secondly, United Nations should be serious about dealing with terrorism. On one hand, you condemn, on one hand, um, he, a terrorist is blacklisted, on the other hand, you allow him to use his accounts. This is not going to be uh, how you deal with terrorism and how serious you think you are with the world affairs. If you really think that terrorism has to be dealt with, then United Nations also should be very, very strong and firm in its decisions and not allow Hafiz Said to use his accounts. It is absolutely practically impossible to believe that Hafiz Said is not even getting money to uh, eat and to feed his family. He is staying in Pakistan. Pakistan had harbored Osama bin Laden. We all know that uh, fact. And of late, Imran Khan has admitted on uh, television that uh, it was Pakistan Army and Pakistan ISA who used to train the Al-Qaeda. So what else proof does the United Nations want to um, blacklist and to declare that Pakistan is a terrorist state? Pakistan already features in the grey list of FATF for terror funding and is due to final proceedings of the plenary session of Financial Action Task Force scheduled to be held on 2nd week of October. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.